I've been extremely alarmed uh, by wh the way campus culture at, at, at a lot of our, our top schools has changed radically just in the last two years. There's, there's, there are these new ideas about safety, and I hear undergraduates often saying things like, they just take it for granted that a classroom is supposed to be a safe space. Now, if they mean you know, that the teacher shouldn't insult people or people shouldn't, you know, hit each other, of course. But what they mean is that people should not be exposed to ideas that might make them feel marginalized or demeaned. For example, if somebody were to question um, affirmative action, that could be threatening to students who might have benefited from affirmative action. Therefore, you can't question it. And it's very strange that um, um, people are getting in trouble. And I, I was dragged before the Equal Opportunity Commission for showing a video that in class that one student objected to one word that a student said in it. All this really? weird, yeah, well, weird. What, what weird, was the word? Disgusting. So it was, um, it was in the context of a discussion about the dumbfounding scenario, actually, um, and it was a conversation between two UVA undergraduates, and one of them uh, is, uh, you know, he's, he's cross-examining the other one. The experimenter cross-examines the other one, and the guy ultimately says, "Well, I don't know. I can't explain why it's wrong. Well, you know, I guess I just, you know, I have a sister myself, and I just, I would just find it disgusting to watch, you know, to think about having sex with her." Mm. So the experimenter follows the script, which is because people often say something like that. And so the experimenter says, well, I, you know, OK, you'd find it disgusting. But does that make it wrong? I mean, personally, you know, like if I were to see two men having sex, like I personally would find that disgusting. I wouldn't want to mm -hmm. watch it. But, you know, that doesn't make it wrong. I mean, if people are inclined that way, they have every right to do it. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, so, right. OK, so, you know, I, I've shown this video 50 times. Um, but by the time class was over, a student had emailed the dean to complain about my homophobia. Um, I thought she must have just missed the part. She must have misunderstood the video. I mean, I said, well, come talk to me tomorrow. Let's, let's look at the video. You'll see. He's not condemning homosexuality. He's actually pro-gay rights. Um, but, it, you know, she engineered it. Basically, she brought the class to a standstill. She demanded that I apologize. And finally, I, you know, she bullied me into apologizing. And finally, I did uh, just because I had to keep the class going. And this was because it was an intensive class every day for a week. Hmm. Um, so I apologized, but she didn't like the apology. So she brought me in front of the Equal Opportunity Commission, which then there was no way that they were going to convict me. I and mean, it, we had this, this is at UVA? No, it's at NYU. Um, and uh, but the point is, it, it, it took like about a month out of my life. And during that time, she uh, mounted a social media, or she had other people mount a social media campaign, writing things about how homophobic I am. So it was a, really a nightmare. Mm. And I was so, like, what the hell is going on? Like, where is it? You know, it just didn't make any sense. I mean, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I've been parts of groups uh, uh, pushing for gay rights. My research is on disgust. Actually, I have a paper that, uh, showing how you can reduce prejudice against gay people. So I felt like, what, you know? My intentions are, are, are all in the right place. I didn't say anything. What's, what's going on? Um, and then other things similar to that happened to me and then began happening to, to lots of other people. And this is in the 2013 to 2014 academic year is when this all begins to happen. The campus is invitations, the words trigger warning and safe space, they barely exist before 2012. But by 2014, they're everywhere. Um, and this is why when Greg Lukianoff, who is the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, when he came to me in the summer of 2014 with his diagnosis that you know, John, this weirdness going on on campus, it's exactly the, the errors that I learned about in cognitive therapy. Like campus is teaching undergraduates to think in the exact distorted ways that cognitive therapy teaches you not to do, like catastrophizing, mm. mind reading, all, you know, all those sorts of things. And so I was so busy. I was saying no to everything. But when Greg came to me after my own experiences, I said, oh, my God, Greg, this is brilliant. This is, this is what's going on. So that's what led to he and I writing this article that was published in The Atlantic last August. And it was, you know, we had no idea campuses were going to melt down beginning at Halloween at Yale, Missouri, uh, so many other schools. So a very strange thing is happening. And I think it's so interesting. I mean, it's horrible because it basically has put a chill on free speech. Everyone is afraid of saying anything that will set off the most sensitive student in the class. Every, you know, professors all over the country are scrubbing their syllabi clean. Mm. We're not showing videos that could provoke. We're not saying things. So education is taking a nosedive in this country because everyone's afraid of, of you know, a big social media storm or being charged with, with uh, marginalizing or whatever it is. So this is what's happening. Um, and, and this is purely a liberal phenomenon, right? Is, is there a conservative analog to this or is this just a little bit? Yeah. So what happens? So so there's a wonderful paper on the origin of microaggressions. In fact, if, if uh, listeners just Google where uh, where microaggressions really come from, I wrote a summary of this article and what these authors uh, Manning and Campbell to sociologists, what they point out is that microaggressions, the idea of these, you know, the idea that like if I ask an Asian student, where are you from? That's a microaggression because I'm implying that he or she is not American. The idea that this is an act of aggression 
is an odd idea, but the whole culture of microaggressions, they point out, only emerges in places that are very, very egalitarian, meaning, so that'll be on the left, but, and also that have administrative bodies that will punish um, opponents. So it's the very presence of all the diversity committees, all the ways you can punish people for saying things you don't like. This is why the most progressive places in America, like Yale, Amherst, Brown, the, stu the schools that are erupting in riots are the most progressive left-leaning places. Mm. And it's because the whole idea of seeing everything as a microaggression only flourishes in those places. But to answer your question, once you get this dialogue of, I've been traumatized, I've been offended against, you've, uh, you know, you've committed violence against me. Once you get people on the left saying that about everything, the few people on the right, and there's, you know, there's often a minority, I and mean, there are some conservatives at Yale, Brown, and Amherst, they then start using that language too. So you do see occasional examples of people on the right claiming that they've been traumatized or microaggressed. But mm -hmm. it is mostly a left. It's, it's mostly, it mostly comes from the social justice left. This is a recent phenomenon, but this seems to be of a piece with something that isn't so recent. So like, for instance, the these no-go areas in science, these taboo topics like racial and gender differences in intelligence, you know, the bell curve wars and, you know, Larry Summers getting into hot water at Harvard. And I think I actually you wrote about this some years ago in, in an edge piece. You speculated that mapping the genome is going to open up a much larger front in this war of controversial topics. So I mean, have you thought any more about that? I, I can imagine that, that th this is only making it that much more difficult to touch any of these areas scientifically if you know you're going to get you can't even talk about them in front of your classroom. That's right. So so political correctness is not new. Um, even back in the 60s, there were all kinds of things you could not say. There was a big wave of it in the 19, in early 1990s and hate speech codes, all that sort of stuff. What's new um, is the idea that students or people, but especially students, are so fragile that if they're exposed to something um, that is an offensive idea, they will be traumatized, they will be damaged. And that wasn't there in the 90s. In the 90s, the idea was this is an incredible injustice, you're a bad person for saying this, you're a bad person for studying this. But there wasn't the idea that, oh, you've, 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 traumatized people, you've damaged people. So that's new, the idea of fragility. And this grows out, I've learned a lot since uh, Luke Yanoff and I wrote the Atlantic article. Um, this ultimately seems to grow out of the massive changes in child rearing that happened in the United States after the early 1980s. So um, if you were born before about 1975, uh, then you had a childhood like people all over the world have always had, which is that you spent a lot of time without adult supervision. Mm. And sometimes, sometimes you got in fights, sometimes you got lost, sometimes you got scared, uh, and you'd figure it out yourself. But we had a real crime wave um, beginning in the 70s, and there were several high-profile abductions, especially Aton Pates, three blocks south of where I'm sitting right now in Greenwich. Yeah. Um, and right around the time of Aton Pates, just after that, we get cable TV. And once we get cable TV, we have constant 24-hour coverage of every child abduction. So even though pretty much nobody abducts children other than the non-custodial parent, Americans came to fear that if they ever had kids unsupervised, those kids would be abducted. It is literally illegal to let your eight-year-old walk to a park two blocks away. You can be arrested for mm -hmm. doing that. So parents don't do that. Kids are never without adult supervision until they're you know, mid-teens in many cases. And so what happens is students get to college and they have not, um, they have not had a chance to really deal with setbacks and, uh, and even insults on their own. There's always been some authority that they should appeal to. So they get to college and somebody says something, maybe somebody criticizes affirmative action and that hurts, they don't like it. So what do they do? Um, they, have a, they, they have this uh, whole ideology built for them. They might even have encountered it before college that says that they are a victim of microaggression. Somebody, perhaps a professor, although professors are always on the left, so they might not have been it's probably more a student. Most of the complaints are actually about students. So some student said something and it hurts. And so you don't say something back. You go straight to the dean mm -hmm. or the, you know, the diversity administrator. You file charges. So this is what's new. This, this didn't happen 10 or 15 years ago. This is just the last couple of years. Uh, they call it accountability. They, they say we need to hold professors accountable for what they say. But when, when everybody in the class is holding the professor accountable for not making them feel bad, I mean, it's like being back in, you know, communist Romania or East Germany. Mm. You're speaking to the Politburo. And if you say anything out of line, you know, you're in big trouble. What explains the fact that the adults are caving into this? You've just explained why the kids are coming in like this. But why does the administration yield to this pressure? Uh, because they have painted themselves into a corner. So two things that have, two things that have happened. One, um, there's been rising 
political polarization in the country, um, left and right really, really dislike each other more now than they did 20 years ago. So everybody's more politicized, and the, the administrators and the professors are almost all on the left now. Um, they used to only be about 70 or 80 percent on the left, or whatever. It's, it used to be two to one, left to right. Now it's about five to, between five and 10 to one, left to right. So you have, everybody's increasingly polarized. Everybody's on board with fighting conservatives. Conservatives are bad. Um, there's a kind of a new religion. In fact, linking back to everything we mm -hmm. talked about before, our religious minds have created a new religion of social justice on campus. The religion is social justice. The most sacred thing in the world is the victim, especially the African-American victim. We have blasphemy laws. If someone questions affirmative action, that's blasphemy. It is literally defined as a microaggression to question affirmative action. Uh, 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 Eric Posner, son of um, Richard Posner, mm. uh, associated questioning affirmative action with Holocaust denial. So there are blasphemy laws now. Um, so it's become a religion. And, and so once there, this religion of social justice has taken root in the humanities and increasingly the social sciences, um, now the presidents of the universities faced with demands from students um, cannot say no. They cannot say, uh, you know, in fact, Maybe you do need to toughen up. Maybe you just need to, you know, yeah, sometimes students are going to say things to you. Maybe some of them are even racist. But, you know, we can't have uh, a, a, um, a, you know, a committee prosecuting every time someone says something offensive. They mm -hmm. can't say that. So what they have to do is they have to say, you're right. As the president of Yale said, we have failed you. So the students give him an ultimatum. They say, President Salovey, we demand that you do these things. You must respond by Wednesday. Now, if you're the president of the university, what should you do? Should you respond by Wednesday? But he has to, or rather, I shouldn't say he has to, he chose to. And so all over the country, presidents are caving, they're giving in, they're validating this victim narrative, um, and they're promising to do things like more microaggression training, more diversity training, which are going to make things worse. I've been reviewing the literature on this. Diversity training, especially if it's done in a vindictive way, backfires. So mm -hmm. it's a disaster. What's going on on campus is a disaster. I'm not on a campus, so I, I really just have to ask people like you, but, but my perception of this problem, just reading articles like your own and, and seeing people push back against it, as you are doing here and as you did in your article, I guess I've been too sanguine about this. My, my sense was that this, this problem must be, if not on the verge, it's, at least it's, it's on the, in the process of being pushed back, right? You, know, you, you seem to be saying that it's going to get a lot worse. What people don't understand, if you're not on a college campus now, if you graduated before 2013, you have no idea what's going on because this only emerged in 2013, 2014 at a few places. And then it spread. Now, it, last fall is when it spread. So we're now living in a world of social media where ideas can spread so fast that would have taken years before. Um, so if you graduated before 2013, you, you haven't seen this stuff. It kind of has the character of, of what we often call a moral panic. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's a moral panic, but it, it only makes sense given the new religion of social justice. Social justice has become the religion of the humanities and parts of the social sciences, not the natural science. The natural sciences still work like real sciences. Right. I've been noticing the problems in liberalism of late, and I've, I've, I've called myself a liberal for as long as I've had any political identity at all. And it, you know, I, I reliably align with liberal principles on, you know, I check almost every box, except once we start talking about things like the clash of civilizations and the problem with political Islam. And, and then, then all of a sudden I sound, or at least I'm attacked as something more like a conservative on those topics. But I don't even know why I still call myself a liberal, given how endemic this confusion is in liberalism. And, and there's something, I, you don't call yourself a liberal anymore. You're, you're a centrist, right? That's right. But, there, but there's two things going on. Uh, so America screwed up the word liberal. We, we have no idea what it means. Um, so liberal, if, if just read John Stuart Mill, uh, classical ideas about creating space in which individuals can be free to pursue their life projects. You can't tell me what to do. I can't tell you what to do unless you're hurting me. And here we don't mean hurting my feelings in an indirect way. You know, unless you're interfering with my life project or hurting me, you can't tell me what to do. So that's liberal. In that sense, you're liberal, I'm liberal, almost everybody on campus is is liberal, uh, most conservatives are liberal. Yeah, well, libertarians answer to that description, yeah. So so that's the, the word liberal. And in Europe, that's still what more what it means. We in America began equating liberal with left, and that's a mistake. So I was always on the left, and I think you're saying that you were and are still on the left. As a result of writing The Righteous Mind, I have moved to the center. I'm no longer on the left. 
left. I've never voted for Republican, uh, and boy, it's not looking like I'm going to this year either. Mm. Um, but I'm no longer on the left. But what's really going on, I think you put your finger on it, is illiberalism. So the the uh, everybody, all the faculty are, they call themselves liberal, they're on the left, but there's a huge difference between the illiberal left and the liberal left. The illiberal left is saying, you can't use that word, you have to use this word. You can't wear that clothing, that's cultural appropriation. You must do this. We get to say, we get to dictate how everybody lives on campus. That is what is happening. And this is emerging not from the faculty on the left, this is emerging from the students, the illiberal left. It's, it's a small group, it's not most of the students. But the liberal left is afraid to stand up to them because if you stand up to them, you're racist, you're sexist. So all over, you know, at many campuses, I hear this from so many students and faculty, you know, somebody will say something outrageous, Many people in the room think, oh, my God, that's crazy. But nobody has the guts to stand up because they're afraid of being called racist. But look, any virtue carried to extreme becomes a vice. So egalitarianism carried to extreme, as happened under Mao, says, you know, the people, there's the good class and the bad class, is what Mao said. Um, if you're poor, if you're a peasant, you're the good class. If you owned a business, if you're wealthy, you're the bad class. Basically, what we see on campus now with the ideology of privilege, they're the good people and the bad people. The bad people are those who are privileged, which is all white people, all men, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a rabid egalitarianism that I think has become bad. Hmm. But the other thing, and this is what's new just recently, um, is the inclusiveness. So inclusiveness is a good thing. Uh, we, we do need to take affirmative steps to make sure we're not inadvertently marginalizing or alienating African Americans, uh, uh, Latin Americans. So, you know, so inclusivity is a good thing. But carried to extreme, it becomes bad. And what's happened is this in this new religion of social justice, um, the, the central virtues are inclusivity and equality. And if anyone in the seven marginalized groups feels excluded, that trumps everything else. And this is where it becomes bad, and this is where it becomes impossible to have a university. Mm. Because now we can't, you know, I can't say something. I can't present a scientific theory. I can't present, you know, if we're going to talk about why are women underrepresented in the STEM fields, and if a professor were to say, well, actually, you know, prenatal testosterone actually influences what children enjoy doing. Might that be relevant? You can't say that. I mean, I just said it. But but a professor on the left can't say that. So you, you literally, if you, if you were teaching that subject area, you would feel that you actually had to drop that fact from the lecture? Me personally, um, I would be I would be very hesitant to say that at NYU, not that NYU was particularly bad, but because that's where they could file charges against me. But if I'm not at NYU, I'm free to say it because students at other schools can't really do much to me. But yes, students, uh, I've heard from many professors, they are simply avoiding controversy because it's just not worth the trouble. It can take months of your life. That's incredible. I mean, but again, the, the yeah. point is that if you once you make inclusion a sacred value, that means no trade-offs. That means uh, the, the, you know, there are seven marginalized groups. So it's African Americans, women, and gay people, LGBTQ. That's the three big ones. Mm. Then there's um, L L Latinos, um, uh, Native Americans, uh, 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 disabled or mentally ill. So those are, and that's that's six. That's where we were for the last ten or twenty years. But just in the last year, now it's Muslims. Muslims are the seventh. Mm. So if you say anything that uh, criticizes Islam or that would any way make Muslim students feel uncomfortable, that's, that's, like, that's racism, that's homophobia. So, uh, I, so professors are going to be very, very careful here, from here on in about saying anything critical of Islam. Interesting. Well, I guess I can claim to have done my part on that. <laughs> yeah, good thing you're not a professor.